I'm Dr. Bo Beard here at the farm in Birmingham, Alabama. And today we're talking about rotation during running and in particular talking about the spinal engine theory. So if you're up to snuff on the running game, you probably read something, saw something about Des Linden breaking the world record, uh, female world record for 50K, which I was on a road, not on a trail, um, sub three, so she ran in 259. The more impressive thing uh, than just setting the record, uh, which really impressive time was, uh, I mean, they call her the human metronome because <laughs> I think every mile was within a second or just a few seconds. And um, I could look that up real quick, but uh, maybe I'll put a picture in the, the notes on this, but very consistent throughout. So just talking about, you know, elite level runners and, you know, anytime we talk about running, somebody's going to bring up something about running form when it comes to efficiency. And if you get somebody that's that efficient, right, that mile per mile for 36 miles, we're just going to do the same thing incessantly that has stellar results. Maybe that's somebody that we should look at. So let me share my screen here and we're going to take a look at this is uh, 2018. So if you remember this, this is 2018 Boston Marathon. It was just uh, blowing rain in the runner's face, pretty strong headwind. And she pulled out a win after a pretty crazy uh, kind of fight in the women's top three. So let's just kind of look at some of this stuff. So we've got a couple people running in front of her here. Now, what I want you to notice right away is sometimes we talk about this uh, too much rotation occurring uh, in running, right? That we get crossover that we, you know, and I hear this a lot from people that I'm not gonna, you know, throw salt in anybody's wound, but maybe they don't know as much about running as they think they do. And they've just heard somebody talk about something and then they bleh, spew that same information out. So let's look at the elite women leader. So we're over here on the left side of the screen. And then we got the chase group, which is Des Linden um, and another runner. Are we seeing that, man, all three of these runners have quite a bit of rotation occurring that it almost looks like their hands are crossing over their midline a little bit. Dear Lord, right? And I'm going to move ahead here. So this is a really good view. So we can see the woman in the middle. <laughs> And this is also elite men. Uh, there's, there's some hands across the midline there. There's shoulder rotation, torso rotation occurring. If we look at all three women, now I realize we're at an angle. If you look at Des Linden, who's in third there, her arm is completely across her chest and it looks like her right foot is crossing midline. And that's what you're going to see out of a lot of good runners. So I'm going to back out of this and I'm going to queue up this right here. So let's back out. So if you're familiar with this runner, this is, uh, she'll remain unnamed because I really, I don't know if I should be using her picture or not, but you know who she is. She's my running crush. Um, there's a lot of rotation occurring here. And I believe in this race right here, she's running the 800, a little bit faster race than a 50K or a marathon. I get it. But form across the elites doesn't really change very much in speeds. You're going to see a lot of the same similarities from an elite sprinter to an elite distance runner with minor variances throughout. So when we see uh, this runner, what do we see? We see rotation occurring all the way from, oh, let me back this up. Yeah, surprise. Uh, all the way from uh, head to toe, literally, right? The right shoulder is tracking ahead of left shoulder. We see crossover across midline with her left hand. Look all the way down. You can see torque or rotation occurring across her abdomen, massive internal rotation of the left leg, all the way down to internal rotation of the tibia, ankles and plantar flexion, slight inversion. And then obviously the opposite on the other side, which is a, a giant cross crawl pattern, right? These, these things start happening early in life. So yeah, a lot of people are surprised to tell you know, we got this idea that we're supposed to be running like Tom Cruise, right? This like, you know, put, put them up and down, knees up and down, arms high. Uh, yeah, it's just not true. How I explain this, and then we'll uh, dive into some explanations that are probably a little bit uh, more developed, a little more sophisticated from some actual researchers, uh, is kind of like the drive shaft on a car, right? So the drive shaft on a car 
is spinning perpendicular to the axis of movement. So if a car is moving forward on the road, that drive shaft is spinning perpendicular. Well, it's creating torque. And then the differential, right, is what creates, that's why it's called a differential. It's taking rotational torque and turning it into angular velocity or moving now um, the axle in the plane of motion. And this, you know, if we're thinking forward, backwards, sagittal plane of a runner, it's not wholly like that. Obviously we're not, you know, rotating one direction, our body's going another fully, but it is. And it's this ability to first resist. This is one of the tenets of treatment. And then especially training in the farm is you have to be able to resist, <clears throat> excuse me, resist rotation, resist a force, any force in any of the three planes of motion, um, sagittal, chronal, um, transverse before you can create it efficiently. Uh, and if you try to create force without being able to resist it, there's probably some sort of compensation or a tissue that's going to pay a price for that ability to create power without great resistance or stability, however we want to kind of determine that. So the, one of the more up-to-date looks at this was by Elphinstone in 2013 that's talking about transferring force from lower to upper zones, right? And this this has been talked about a lot and you're going to see that. And this was called the elastic support strategy. Um, and that's just saying that we're getting counter rotation from the hips and the pelvis that then creates the ability to create torque, to move somebody forward a little more efficiently than just pushing forward with what we would think of these angular joints, hip, ankle, knee, right? Well, the first person to ever talk about this was Serge Grigovetsky. Grekovechki, I believe that's how you say his name. Um, but I'm going to kind of pull up something else here real quick. So I'm going to back out of that. So Sergey, Serge, however you want to say it, um, was actually, it's pretty interesting. So if you go to this castlebodywork.com, we'll put it in the show notes. You can read a little bio about him. But he was a nuclear physicist um, from Switzerland. And uh, he started, he experienced some pain himself. And he started thinking more about pain and in particular spinal biomechanics, how they related to pain. And ended up, that's the career path that he paid for himself, uh, moving away from just a purely nuclear uh, physics background. And through that, he's the first person that came up with this idea of the spinal engine. And then that spinal engine theory had a huge play in, let me back out of there, sorry, in the idea of running. And you can see what he's kind of explaining just with this picture here that, you know, there's counter rotation, just like the elastic support strategy. But the reason he thought this was when you look at how much torque can be applied to the ground by the foot in the lower extremity, it's, it's virtually none. There's very little. So he thought, well, if you can't create torque into the ground, how are you actually creating good angular momentum moving forward? So he thought, well, where is torque being created? Because obviously rotation is occurring in the spine. And if it's not being driven from the foot up, it's got to be driven from the top down. And that's where he kind of said, there must be a fixed stable point for the muscle to pull from if it is to fulfill its function effectively. What's that sound really similar to? It sounds like the idea of a punctum fixum from dynamic st stabilization, uh, reflex locomotion that was popularized by, uh, you know, uh, collage and Yanda and um, all of these great clinicians that kind of said, hey, you have to have a fixed point to pull your body into a position rather than creating force through the gravitational field or into the ground that then moves your body without that control. And that's a lot of what DNS is capitalizing on with exercise and rehab is that we kind of flip the function to more of usually more of a closed chain function um, because that's how we kind of move from the ground up. Well, that follows us throughout life that now we create a fixed point, um, in my opinion, centrally through things like intra-abdominal pressure, through uh, co-activation uh, around the core, like a corset, rather than thinking that we're you know, drawing the belly button in, things like that, that we have this eccentric load against the tissue, but really a uh, pressurization of the tissues within the abdominal cavity outward, right? Organs, integument all these things. Um, and he said, you know, this is efficient for movement, maintains motion in the most direct plane for the required task. So this isn't just talking about running forward. So if I'm running forward and I have to cut, um, there's counter rotation and torque that's going to occur at various places to make that occur, right? We would imagine the Heisman, right? 
there's a big cross body rotation going on with the opposite side arm as the leg that would be cutting to go back the opposite direction. That makes sense when you do it. Like if I said, Hey, run as fast as you can cut left, cut, right. You're going to see the rotation and you would just do it without thinking about it. For some reason in the coaching world in particular running, we've been coached into this idea that it's this just angular, you know, pumping of the arms. Hey, we'll coach people out of this rotation. Uh, we see people that lack rotation because they've been coached. Um, and then there's the whole flip side of the coin of maybe you lack rotation because you're truly stiff, right? You don't have great rotation through these great transitional areas or the major joints that create rotation, which would be what? Thoracic spine, hip. And then when we see the pelvis moving, that's a function of what? That's really a function of hip and pelvic rotation together. Um, and then you also have to have adequate cervical spine rotation. Otherwise you're gonna kind of drag your head with you. Um, and then we don't really talk so much about shoulder extension, which gets lost a lot in our normal uh, everyday society due to functioning mainly in kind of flexion adduction. Now, you know, we looked at Corey McGee, Hope oh, I said her name, that's my, you know, my running crush. Uh, we could look at other people like Priska Jeptu and things, you know, runners like that, that um, are not, don't look ideal. Right. And just because you don't look ideal does not mean that you're not efficiently creating torque, which we can see a lot of rotation and torque occurring here. And what I would beg to differ is that I'm guessing I've never treated this runner, um, you know, hands on. But if we lay them down, I'm guessing there's going to be some form of antiversion of the hips, which allows a, a massive amount of internal rotation, which allows you to create more torque, better peak angular velocity moving forward, which has been proven. Um, and then that, that they just make that efficient. And for a lot of people would say, oh my God, this isn't, this doesn't look great. But if your hips don't move like her, and then that's how you run, that may be where the problem comes from. And across the board, you know, if we took a snapshot of elite runners, they're all going to look very much the same. So I don't understand why it's been this misconception that rotation is not occurring through the torso. The spinal engineering is not occurring and that we need to train people to create better sagittal plane angular motion to create a better runner. It's just not true. And, you know, you could be drastically overdoing it, right? I agree that over rotating with not a lot of angular momentum forward is not a great thing. But I think when we get into the elite runners that maybe we take some lessons from them and then we always have to be aware that there's always one step before coaching somebody. And that's, can you do something before you try to do something. So if I can't rotate through my torso, if I can't extend my shoulder, and if I can't create internal rotation of my hip, you have to give somebody or work on the ability to do those things first before you have the capability to apply them to a skill level activity such as running. So I hope that helps people understand how rotation is uh, occurring in running, why it's important to running, and then as far as ideas on how to work on it, again, that's where sometimes it gets into, can you rotate? Um, maybe you just need to relax a little more. I promise you the worst thing you can go do is try to throw yourself into big motions of rotation and think that's gonna improve it. It's a very relaxed, natural part of running if you let it happen and if it can happen. So I appreciate you guys watching. If you have any questions, drop it in the comments below, or you can reach out to me on social media at Dr. Bo Beard, and I'll see you guys next time.